Sabbath peace. Another opportunity for us to come together and hear and learn of the word of truth as given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We understand that it is uh, obtained by grace through faith, not of works. But given freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that. What? You messed me up. What, I, what was I supposed to say? What part I missed? The Shabos. What did you say? The Shabos? How'd it go? Y'all messed me up. <laughs> Sabbath peace. This is another opportunity for us to hear and learn of the word of truth as given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son. What's next? Name is Yahushua and in him lies the only only hope for salvation what's next you skip it going all the way to the gift of tongues the gift of prophecy Anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues or a gift of prophecy, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. But that said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that didn't make it, but no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. You got me skipping all types of stuff, boy. Let's go to, um, well, let's recap first. Let's recap. So last week, we uh, what did we talk about? I got to remind myself what we darn talked about last week. Last week. What we talked about last week, brother? The Jesus. shepherds. Mm, yeah. We read it. We read in Ezekiel. Read about the shepherds, right? The shepherds was, uh, you know what I'm saying? The shepherd got to lead the people properly, right? And we follow people. We follow like sheep, right? Most High God was upset with the shepherds because the shepherds took care of themselves. They ate. But they gave everybody else the muddy waters. Ain't that what he told us? Yeah, he told us that he gave he gave everybody else the muddy muddy waters, and that's what happens with the leadership. What else we talk about? We read Lamentations. We didn't read Lamentations last week, did we? Yeah, we did. I feel like that was two weeks ago. All right, but yeah, we uh then that means we read Lamentations and we read Obadiah. Right, mm -hmm. we read about the the Edomites. Right, and how, how Edom stood and they watched us get taken up and they was happy about it. They were saying, raise it, raise it. Right? They saying, go ahead, take them boys. Right? They were cheering them on when 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 they were uh when they were taking us down. Right? Our people didn't like that. Right? Most high God didn't like that. So he told Eden, he told the uh remember he told the Edomites, he was like, Listen, if somebody steal from you, won't they take till they got enough? <laughs> right? He said, Listen. If somebody take all the grapes out of the field, right? If you go gather all the grapes out of the field, won't you at least leave some grapes? He said, but no, nah, with the Edomites, it ain't going to be like that with y'all. He said, he's not going to leave no one, right? He ain't leaving anybody, all right? So that's what it's all about. We're going to look at it. Um, I want, well, before we, before we go any further, let's kind of recap where we are right now, right? So. We know that Zedekiah, King Zedekiah, right, was being being counseled somewhat by by Jeremiah the prophet, right. So Jeremiah the prophet was talking to Zedekiah, but Zedekiah was in a place where he didn't want to follow the Most High God all the way, right. It was a lot of pressure from the people. He in the middle of a war. He's the king. He's responsible for this. Jeremiah is telling him, give himself over to the king of Babylon. Right. Zedekiah is looking like, man, my people ain't going to go for that foolishness. So he locked he locked Jeremiah up. Eventually, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar at this time, came 
took Zedekiah, destroyed our temple, right? Got the majority of our people and moved them into Babylon, right? So then the only people left here was the poor. So then Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, set up Gadaliah, right? And we only read a little bit about Gadaliah. We didn't look at we didn't look at the whole story of Gadaliah. Uh, Brother T told y'all y'all can read that in Jeremiah. I think it's like Jeremiah 40, 41, somewhere around there. We're going to start telling you about Gadaliah. But uh, the short version of, of what we read for Gadaliah is that a man named Ishmael came up and he set Gadaliah up and killed him. Right. And a lot of the people were a little bit, you know what I'm saying, nervous about staying under staying in the land because of uh the king of babylon right so you can read more about that with jeremiah so gadaliah ends up dying right we read about ezekiel he gets word that the temple was destroyed right read that and then a little while ago we kind of did it out of order but a little little while ago we read about how nebuchadnezzar lost his mind remember that when we talk about nebuchadnezzar he, he, he wrote a letter. This is uh, Daniel chapter four. He wrote a letter and he was talking about how he lost his mind. He was running around like the animals, right? He was running around in the field like, a, huh? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? He was running around like an animal. And all of a sudden, after seven years, I think it was, he looked up and he, and most high God restored his mind and he started to serve God, right? So that was Nebuchadnezzar. So that brought us to the end of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, right? Did we read about uh, Evil Motorot? No, just whatever it told us in, uh, uh, I don't know if it was Kings, but we just. Yeah, like where he brought Jeconiah back? Or yeah, I think we touched it a little bit. Well, let's let's grab it real quick. I think it's what, Kings 25? Second Kings 25? It's short. I don't know where it's at in there. It should be towards the end, though. Second Kings chapter 25, maybe verse, mm, I don't know, maybe it's verse 25. If anybody know how I can order these by the caseload for a decent price, let me know. All right, yeah, this is... I put these things on a permanent subscription. You know what I'm talking about? Goodness gracious, I love these things. That was peace, Sister Sharon. Second Kings 25, 27. So this is Second Kings chapter 25, verse 27. Watch what the book say. And it came to pass in the seventh and thirteenth year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the twelfth month. On the seven and twentieth day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon. Right. So this is the king of Babylon that came after Nebuchadnezzar. So at this point, Nebuchadnezzar had already gone crazy and stopped being king. So evil Merodach, he's the one who takes over. And let's see what he does. In the year that he began to reign, did did lift up the head of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, out of prison. And he spake kindly to him and set him a throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon and changed his prison garments. And he did eat bread continually before him all the days of his life. And his allowance was a continual allowance given him of the king, a daily rate for every day, all the days of his life. All right. So even Morada, he ended up taking care of Jehoiachin. That was all according to Jeremiah's prophecy also. So that puts us at about this time frame right here. So now if we look at this time frame, just visually, there's only two prophets that's around at this point. It's Ezekiel. It's the very end of Ezekiel. Right. And you have Daniel. So there's still more Ezekiel that we can read, but we're not going to touch it. We probably won't touch that part, those parts of Ezekiel until we get to uh, Revelations. Right. So we're going to we're going to continue on with Daniel and we're going to look at some very important prophecies from Daniel. So let's look at uh, Daniel chapter. Give me Daniel chapters. Uh, Daniel chapter seven.
In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of, of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. The first year of who? The first year of Bel Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Right. So this is another king of Babylon that came after evil Merodach. Right. This Nebuchadnezzar, evil Merodach, and some people in between technically. And then you have um, Belshazzar. Right. Let's keep going. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four What is it? Wind... Daniel chapter, this Daniel chapter 7, verse what, 3? Mm -hmm. It's Daniel chapter 7, verse 3. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Put that Barbie down, boy. The first... he, said, he said, four great beasts came up, what? The four winds of heaven and strove upon a great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. Mm -hmm. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. <laughs> right. So notice what he's describing. He said the first one was a, like a lion. He said that thing was made to stand up like a man and a man's heart was given to it. Right? Keep that in mind. Keep going. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in his mouth of it between the teeth of it. And right? Then it said, then you had a bear that was raised up on one side. Let's see. Keep going. And it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said mm -hmm. thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. And the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and the wheels were burning as fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands of thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. Behold, then, because of the voice of the great words which were which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. I saw in the night. So one beast, pay attention to what just happened, right? You had this beast, the most terrible out of all the beasts. It had horns coming out. And in the days of that horn, the ancient of days came. And that beast got destroyed. But then the other beast kept going. Right? Read that part again. When we get to Revelation, we're going we're gonna to break a lot of this stuff down. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. In a mouth speaking great things, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and the wheels as wheels as burning fire. Mm -hmm. The fiery stream issued and came forth before him. Thousands of thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. 
The judgment was set and the books were opened. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. And considering and concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season in time. I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Right. So when we see this vision, this is Daniel's vision talking about one like the son of man. Right. So if you ever read the gospel, right, and you read about Yahushua and you see he always references himself as the son of man, the son of man, the son of man, the son of man. This is what this is what he's referencing. Right. It's important to understand that, like he's not just calling himself son of man just because he feel like calling himself son of man. He's saying son of man because anybody who's listening, who know the scriptures would know what he's saying is I'm that guy who's going to pop up on the cloud. Right. That's what he's trying to tie back to. That's what he's trying to remind everybody of. Like, yo, y'all remember when Daniel was talking about that son of man that came in the clouds? That's me. Right. So he's saying son of man, son of man, son of man, just like this says. Keep going. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him of the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. So now somebody's going to interpret it for us, right? Watch this. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Mm -hmm. Then I would know the truth of the four beasts, the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his, na and his nails of brass which devoured, breaking pieces, and stamped the residue with its feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had, had eyes and a mouth that spake great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them. Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall which is, shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of his kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. And another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall, war, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until the time and the times of the dividing of time. Uh, until a time in times and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it until the, uh, until the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high whose kingdom is everlasting and an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him hitherto is the end of the matter as for me daniel my my cogitations much troubled me and my countenance changed in me but i kept the matter to heart all right so he said i kept i kept that thing to myself he is like, but that thing, man, that thing messed me up, right? Because he's looking, he's like, I see this vision of these, these four beasts, and the last one was a dreadful, terrible beast, right? And then this, this man, he come and tell him about it, like, yo, this is what this mean, man. It's all these beasts, it's just kings. When they say kings, it's really thinking, think of it as we think of the empire. It's not talking about one person. That's why when he mentioned the last king, quote unquote king, he said that there were 10 kings that came out of that one. So he's talking about an empire, right? He's talking about a kingdom, right? So he's saying these are these are all these what we would consider empires, right? And then the last one got these kings that come of it. And then one king subdued three kings and 
He makes some terrible stuff happen. Like, what in the world is going on? He's trying to figure it out, right? But ultimately, the Saints take over. The Saints is the ones that get it. So this is kind of, for those that was on the fellowship call last week, this is this is this is the same topic that we was talking about when we were talking about how Yahushua is gonna come on the clouds. We actually referenced one part of this, right? So it's it's the same type of subject. You know what I'm saying? We went a little deeper than we're about to go now. But I just want y'all to be aware because we're gonna touch back on this whenever we get to Revelation. It's a lot of stuff we're gonna come pick back up. I wanna go over this one now. Some stuff I'm skipping because I know we're gonna talk about it with Revelations, but I wanna talk about this one now. Just because the imagery is so strong and it's going to help us when we get to the gospel, right? A lot of this stuff is going to help us in the gospel. Knowing what kings or kingdoms are in place, that's going to help us. Keep going in uh, chapter 8. Chapter 8. This is uh, Daniel chapter 8, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, the vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. Mm -hmm. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that it was I was in Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river. Hold Ura. on, right there. You said he said he was where? In Shushan in the palace. Hold that. Go to Esther. Let me see where she was. It's Esther chapter one, verse one. It's the same place. I just want y'all to see that all this stuff is kind of happening. It's it's a bunch of stuff happening around the same time, same folks, uh, uh, different folks involved, but it's the same stuff happening around our our things are happening around the same time period in the same places. So Shushan is way off. It's far away from our land, very far from our land, right? But our people are in captivity, right? And Daniel is one of them. But remember, Daniel got a little bit of prestige from uh, Nebuchadnezzar, right? So he gets to move around a little bit. So he's in Shushan. And look at Esther. This is Esther chapter 1, verse 1. Now, it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia over 107 and 20 provinces. 127 provinces that in those days when the king of Hazarus sat on the throne of his kingdom which is in Shushan the palace right so he was in Shushan right so this is a this is a little bit later than what we reading from Daniel right but you'll see that this is the same place as Daniel so we're gonna get to Esther later we're a little bit before Esther time right but you'll see that Daniel's in the same place that you know, the events that we talk about Esther, like we just celebrated Purim last week or earlier this week, rather. Right. We just celebrated Purim. So with, with, with Purim, that's where we get it from. It's the book of Esther. All right. So let's go back. This is Daniel chapter eight. where we have verse probably three. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns and two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Mm -hmm. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And I, right, and so I you had a ram that had two horns, one was higher than the other. Right, that's similar to the bear, right? That was lifted up on one side. Right? Then what else happened? And as I was considering, behold, a he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched mm -hmm. not the ground, and the goat had no a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which had, I had seen standing before the river. And ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram. And he was moved with choler against him. And smote the ram and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to, do, to stand before him. 
but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. So now you have a ram that got taken down. You got a ram had two horns, one higher than the other. And you got a goat that took that ram down. And he only had one horn, a, no, a notable horn, though. Right? But watch what happens to that notable horn. Keep going. Therefore, the he goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And for it came up for and and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of the one of them came four a fourth a little horn, which was right. exceedingly. So great. now that's that's very similar to what we read about the leopard, right? The leopard in the last one, he had four heads. Right? So keep going. And he waxed exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great, even the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Mm -hmm. Yay, he That's very important, right? We're going to read about that later also, right? So you had this horn that cast down even the stars of heaven, right? Very important. We got to understand what that means, but... This when 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 we understand what this vision is, when this vision is taking place and what people this is, then we understand the timing of that event, right? When the horn cast down the stars of heaven. Keep going. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And the host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it, and it cast down the truth to the ground. And it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking. And another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall the vision be concerning the daily sacrifice, and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand in 300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as an appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now, as right, so he's saying, understand, O son of man, this vision is going to be at the time of the end. In other words, this is going to be end times. Watch this. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For all the time appointed, the end shall be. The ram which you saw having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. And mm -hmm. The rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Right. So now we know that the, the ram represented Media and Persia as one unit. Right. Two different nations kind of combined together working against each other, but working together. This actually happened throughout history. This is talking about media in Persia, right? So today, media in Persia would be, you know, the uh, Iran area. You know, I like uh, they saying right now, Iran is teaming up with the different folks. So Iran area and probably like the Armenia area. If you were to look on the map and you find Iran and you find Armenia, in northern Turkey, right, uh, like northeast Turkey, right, that's going to be the, the, the area of people that we're talking about right now, right? But two very different types of people, right? So media, if you remember, if, you, if we went all the way back to Genesis chapter 10, we don't have to right now, but if we went all the way back to Genesis chapter 10, media is, um, is uh, Japheth, right? And then Persia 
comes from Shem. Right? So two very different people. However, these people were intermingled. Right? Keep going. Seven feet, Sister Pamela. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but no, not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall, shall stand up. So now pay, pay very close attention. When the time has come from the, to, to a fool at the end time, right? What, what nation of people are we talking about right now? Greece. Right? We're talking about Yvonne or Greece, right? It's, called, it's translated in the book as Greece. But it's actually more broad than what we would see Greece as today, right? It's talking about the people of Yavon, right? So the people of Yavon come from Japheth as well, right? Gentiles. And he said, these people of Yavon, this would be, Yavon would kind of capture the area of Greece, Turkey, um, and uh, some of the islands that's right off of Turkey, like those areas, probably a little Italy, all that. Right. It's going to be those areas. Right. So it's it's telling you that in the end time, it's going to be a little horn that comes from Greece or Yvonne. Right. And that's going to be a bad boy. He's going to understand dark sentences. The book say keep going. Watch this. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall mm -hmm. prosper in practice and shall destroy and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people and through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many he shall also stand up against the prince of princes but he shall be broken without hand and the vision of this evening of this evening and the morning which was told is true wherefore shut up the vision for it shall be for many days and i daniel a couple key things that we should note on to right there. One, he's going to destroy people through peace. Right? So through peace, he is going to destroy people. Right? We're going to read about that. Another key thing is he will have power, but not of his own. Right? All these are ideas that we're going to read. We're going to see about it when we get to Revelation. So I want y'all to kind of latch on to it. And then lastly, he himself is going to go up against the prince of princes, talking about Yahushua, right? The ruler of rulers. When we say prince, he's saying he, gonna, he himself is going to go up against the ruler of rulers, right? So he's going to go head to head with Yahushua, right? Or try to, right? So when, last week when we, uh, yeah, last week when we, on uh, the fellowship call, when we talked about the uh, son of man coming on the clouds, talking about how the son of man there's somebody who riled up all the nations to fight against him right and it's going to be one guy this is this is who it's talking about right one guy that ended up rallying everybody up he gonna try to go head to head with him and he gonna lose right but notice that he comes out of yavon or greece right that is that is very important for us to understand so let's get um Let's kind of look at some imagery of, of what we just talked about, right? Y'all remember when we read Daniel chapter 2. Y'all probably don't remember, so I'm going to try to remind y'all. We got Daniel chapter 2 here. Y'all remember the vision that Daniel had in Daniel chapter 2, where he saw, he saw this image. He told Nebuchadnezzar he had an image, and it had a gold head, right? It had a, a silver breastplate. All right, then he told him he had, you know what I'm saying, his uh his belly was bronze. All right. And as things kept going going, you had iron legs. Yeah, he had iron legs. And after the iron legs, he had feet of uh he had feet of clay, right? Clay and iron kind of mixed together. And Daniel gave an interpretation of that, right? And he said, 
The first kingdom was Nebuchadnezzar. He said, greatest of all. Right? He didn't name the other kingdoms, but he said, then it's going to be a kingdom after you and a kingdom after that and a kingdom after that. And he talked about all the different kingdoms. So now we're going to take what we just learned, right? Because the, the, the man that Daniel was talking to, that the Most High God sent, revealed some of it, right? So what he revealed, let me put this on the screen for y'all. So what he revealed is he's confirmed uh, two things for us, right? He confirmed the ram was the Medes and the Persians, and he confirmed the he goat was Greece, right? So these two, and when we say Greece, again, it's Yvonne. In actuality, the he goat represented Macedonia, right? Because it's talking about Alexander the Great, right? What it's describing is talking about Alexander the Great. If you look in history, Alexander the Great, after he died, um, his kingdom got split up to four different groups of people. So that's the that's the four horns that came after. And those four horns go away, and there's one notable horn that comes up after him. That's the one that's in the end times, right? So we'll talk about how that ends up playing out also. But if we look at it, we have the Medes and the Persians, right? That lines up with the ram. And we have Greece that lines up with the he goat, right? We need to fill some gaps, though, because we know this first head is Nebuchadnezzar, right? So then if we look at the ram, and we know the ram comes after the goat, right? Then we got to look at the similarities between what was described. If we looked at chapter 7, if you remember, there was a bear. And remember that bear? It was lifted up on one side, just like the ram had a horn that was higher than the other. So what if that bear is also the Medes and Persians from chapter seven? And then you remember we had the lion in chapter seven and the lion, it said the lion had wings and it stood up like a man and it was given a man's heart. Well, the first thing in the statue from Nebuchadnezzar was the gold and, and we confirmed that was Nebuchadnezzar, that was Babylon. So what do we know about Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar went crazy. He is out there with the animals. Right. Then he looked up and the most high God restored him and he ended up serving the most high God. So you could say a beast was given a man's heart. Right. So let's say that lion represents Nebuchadnezzar. Let's say the bear represents the Medes and the Persians. That means right after the Medes and the Persians has to be the, the, the uh, he goat. Right. So the equivalent in that vision would have been the leopard. And it had four heads, right? Just like the he goat had four horns at, at one point. So then lastly, you have this, this monstrosity that we learned about in Daniel 7, right? So what came after, in terms of history, what comes after Greece? The empire that came after Greece was Rome, right? So then after Rome, you had a great split. Right. You had a bunch of stuff split. So after Rome, technically, it got split into multiple ways. But you had the Ottoman Empire. Right. And then from the Ottoman Empire, um, you, you had the Ottoman Empire. And then you also had the uh, the, uh, the the remnants of, of the Roman Empire. Right. And that's what kind of we deal with. That's what leads into um, America. That's what leads into a lot of other stuff that we deal with today. So if we look at this. We say the order is Babylon, Medes and Persians, Greece or Yavon, the Romans, and you deal with some of, you know, at that point, what we would have kind of considered the future stuff. It's important that we understand this because the Romans are in control when Yahushua comes in on the scene. And there are some concepts that we just talked about that, that, Yahushua is going to talk about, right? One of the things that, that uh, Daniel just talked about was an abomination, right? Something that's going to be made desolate. He's going to mention it again as well, right? But this is a concept that Yahushua is also going to latch on to. These are all prophecies that Yahushua is going to latch on to, and I want y'all to be aware of it when we read it, right? 
Let's um let's go to Daniel chapter five. It's Daniel chapter five. Give me verse one. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the ten before the thousand. <clears throat> Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the gold and silver vessels which the which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem. That the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. <laughs> Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and brass and of iron and wood and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. The king saw the part of the hand that wrote. And the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the drunk. Right, so now you got to take into it. They having a party, they enjoying themselves. Everybody chilling. They getting drunk. Then all of a sudden, a man's hand comes out and starts writing on the darn wall. The king can see this happening, so he's troubled by. He's looking like, what in the world? He probably think I drank too much. He think he going crazy. Like what in the world? Am I? But it's right, and they can see it. Watch this. Keep going. And the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that his joints, the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. And the king cried aloud. Get the imagery now. Just like any horror movie. Y'all haven't seen paranormal activity and all that. That's what he's experiencing, right? So he's looking, they partying, they having fun. He got a group of people there, everybody drinking wine. Then all of a sudden, a hand popped out and just started writing on the wall. It's just a hand. You look at it. It's, it's books say a man's hand. So it's just a hand. And it just start writing on the wall. Boom, 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 boom. Right? King see it. Books say his countenance changed. Right? So that means his face changed. His face went from like, it went from, hey, you know what I'm saying? How you doing? That's my boy there. Give me a drink. Let's talk. You know? Oh, oh, shout a clock. Right? Then it went to, all of a sudden, what? You know what I'm saying? He started looking at it. Because it's right and it's just a hand. Then the book say his loins was loose. You know what that means? Man about ready to pee on his darn self. Right? He can't hold himself no more. He about to poop his darn self. Right? That's what the book is talking about. When it say his loins are loose, he can't hold himself no more. Then all of a sudden, his, his knees start clapping together like this. Click, 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 click. So just kind of like how we see on the cartoon. He's shaking. He's shivering. That's how afraid this man is. Right? Watch this. Keep going. Then the king cried aloud to bring the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler of the kingdom. Right? So he said, listen, if anybody can tell me what this thing means, not only am I going to make sure you look good, you going to be the third ruler. In other words, it's going to be me, one person under me, and then you when it comes to making decisions. Right? Keep going. Then came all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing and make known to the king the interpretation of it. Then was mm -hmm. the king Belteshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his loins were astonished. Now the queen by reason of the words of the king and his lords came to the banquet house, the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be chained. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods was found in him. Whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Mm -hmm. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding interprets of dreams 
and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will show the interpretation. All right. Ooh. So now the queen came and told him like, oh, yeah, yo, don't freak out too bad because he's nervous. He's scared. He's looking like, don't nobody know what this means, what this hand is writing. It's a message. What does it mean? I'm going to die. He's, he's freaking out. Right. So the queen's like, relax, relax, relax. I'm sure it's somebody who could do it because your yo, yo father, when he said his father is like, yo, you know what I'm saying? Your ancestor, talking about Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar was a little bit before him. Right. So your ancestor, Nebuchadnezzar, he can like he he has somebody in the kingdom that told him these things. And that man is still alive. So Daniel is old now. Right. But he's like, man, that man is still alive. Let me look. Daniel will tell you what this writing is because he got the spirit of the holy gods is what she how she referred to it. Right. Watch this. Then was Daniel brought in before the king and the king spake and said unto Daniel, are you that Daniel, which are of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought out of jewelry? I have even heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, and they could, and they should, that they should read this writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, but they could not show me the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of thee. That thou came, that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to the interpretation thereof, you shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Watch this. And Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself and give thy reward. He said, Listen, I don't want your gifts. Right? Daniel said, Listen, listen. I don't want your gifts. Keep your gifts. Right? When he said, Let thy gifts be to yourself. That same thing as saying, keep your stuff, man. Right? Watch this. Keep going. Give thy rewards to another. Yet I will mm -hmm. read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, languages, and trembled and feared before him, whom he, whom he, would, whom he would he slew, and whom he would he kept alive. And whom he would, he set up, and whom he would, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like a beast, and his dwelling was like the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven. Till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men. And that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. And you, his son, O Belteshazzar, has not humbled thine heart, though thou knowest all this. All right. So what Daniel is saying to him is, you know what happened. You know what happened to your daddy, right? And it wasn't his literal, it wasn't his literal daddy, but you you we, you know what I'm saying? Customarily, if you come from a man, you'll call him your father, right? So him, you know what I'm saying, it's probably his granddad, right? It's like, you know what happened to your granddaddy or your great-granddaddy. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, you still let this happen. He said, you know these stories. You know this history. However, you still not humble in your heart, even though you know what the Most High God did to him. Right? So he haven't even got to tell them what the writing is saying yet. He just kind of give them a precursor. Right? Keep going. But, but has lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of, of his house before thee, and thou and all thy lords, thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. Thou hast praised the gods of silver and, and gold and of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, hear not, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose, all, whose are all thy ways, thou hast not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Meany, meany, tekel, of harson. This is the interpretation of the thing, meany. God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Right, when you say you weighed in the balances and found wanting, that means 
you got when you had a balance, you had a scale, right? You kind of think of an old school scale, and there's two sides of it, right? So you would put something on one side, and it would lower it because it weighs more, and it'll bring it to to this side. So you know it your your scale is not balanced. You know that this side has more weight than that side, right? But then you put something on this side, and then you'll try to get it to balance. So you'll know, okay, this block of gold is the same weight as this block of gold. So we would use this when we're exchanging something, right? When we trading something. So let's say I say, I say it's going to cost you three shekels, right? Three shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, for me to sell you my donkey, right? So you can hand me what you call three shekels, but shekel is a weight. And so when I'm saying the shekel, according to when well, let's let's not say shekel, let's say three pounds, right? You can hand me three pounds of gold, but that's a weight, right? So if I look at it and I say, okay, I know this gold and it's three pounds, the, I don't know, I can't measure it three pounds unless I have something that is three pounds. So the only thing I got is this scale. So if I say according to the sanctuary, the sanctuary, let's say it's got a bag of rocks that weigh three pounds. So every time somebody has shekels, it takes these three pounds of weight and make sure that the shekel is weighing the same thing as the rocks. Because I know this is three pounds. So this is the balance of the shekel. So you put it on both sides and boom, it's even. That lets me know this is three shekels or three pounds, right? It weighs the same amount as the rocks that I've already verified is three pounds. Right. But if then. I put three pounds on this side and it's heavier. That means you're found wanting on what you get. Right. I need more pounds on what you get because my three pounds is heavier than what you say is three pounds. That don't make sense. They should be even. So that means I need more pounds on your side and then you make it heavy. And then guess what? It balances after a while. Right. So that's what happened. You guys saying he in debt. Wait a minute. He's in debt. in debt. He owes. When he says you you found wanting, you've been put on the balances and you've been found wanting. So he's telling the most high God is saying, You owe me. You walked into this. I did something to you. When I'm talking to your father, I made it but sit his butt down in the field. Get that out of your mouth, you nasty butt. I made it but sit down in the field and run around with animals. Right? And he had to look up to me. And then you walk into all this, you know that happened? Oh, no, boy, you owe me something. He said, I numbered your kingdom and it's over. Right? You've been in the balances and you've been found wanting. In other words, you owe me. You didn't give me three pounds. You were supposed to give me three pounds. That ain't three pounds. I'm weighing it out. It don't balance. Right? Keep going. Here is thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Look, this is the Babylonians, ain't it? Mm -hmm. But now your kingdom is divided, right? It's split, and it's given to the Medes and the Persians. So now pay attention to what we just read from Daniel. Remember, those prophecies that we read from Daniel, it happened before this. So Daniel got the got the opportunity to kind of see all this stuff happen. He had the vision that he dealt with in Daniel 2 with Nebuchadnezzar. He told Nebuchadnezzar himself, yo, you the gold, and it's going to be kingdoms that come after you. Then he had another vision of four beasts. The first one was a lion, stood up like a man and was given a man's heart. The second one was a bear, lifted up on one side. Then the third one was a leopard, had four heads. And then the fourth one was a great, terrible beast. Then he had another vision in chapter eight that said it was a um, it was a ram with one horn larger than the other one, higher than the other one, and then after that you had a goat. So he's seeing all these things happen. Now he see the Medes and the Persians. He's looking like oh, so the silver breastplate on what I described to Nebuchadnezzar must be the Medes and the Persian because they coming after his kingdom. And he's looking like, okay, well, that lion must have been Babylon. And then 
the bear lifted up on one side is the Medes and the Persians. Right? So he's starting to, he at this point, he's probably starting to put it together. Right? But watch what happens. Then commanded Belteshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a gold chain about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that night... So now he was given, he was given uh, authority, right, as the third ruler. Keep going. And that night, Belteshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, and that night was the Belteshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom being about 62 years 62 years old All right so the, now the next one that came up is darius who was a mead All right so darius as a mead he took over that that very night and then he killed belshazzar All right who was the son of um nebuchadnezzar he's a descendant of nebuchadnezzar All right keep going that's the end of the chapter yeah. All right. Go. Uh. Yeah. Let's let's go to uh chapter six. It please. So remember, yeah. right before, right before Belshazzar, uh, right before ne the descendant of Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, right before he dies, he gives authority to Daniel to be third in command. That's important, right? So now you have a new king that's walking in and you got to think of it like when these kings take over, think of it like they taking over a business. Under new management. Huh? Under new management. Under new management, right? Think of it like there's a store and it's running, it's operating. You know what I'm saying? Everybody got shifts. You got a bunch of employees. Everybody know how to work. They got procedures. Everything is in place, right? But then you got this new boss that come in and tell you, we just bought, we, we've acquired this company, right? We don't want to change anything. That's our new boss. When they come in, we don't want to change a thing, right? We just want to learn and understand how you guys do what you, we want you to keep doing what you're doing, right? We don't want to lay anybody off. We don't want to change a thing. So imagine that's a likely how a lot of these kings are coming in. They're coming in like, okay, we'll keep everything going. Y'all got things running well. And then they slowly start tinkering with stuff, right? So watch what, how this plays out. This is Darius. This is uh, this is uh, Daniel chapter uh, 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over right, so now he got to put his management in place, right? He got all these kingdoms, or all this, all this land, all this territory, so he got to put his management in place to make sure things are running the way he wants. Watch this. Keep going. And over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them. And the king right? could have no So Daniel. then three presidents, right? And Daniel was the first of the three presidents. Right? So when you when when you say president, like we have presidents today. So when we think of presidents, we think of like, you know what I'm saying, Obama. Biden and George Washington and all that, right? But literally, you think a president is preside, right? So you preside over, in other words, you kind of rule over. When you when you talk about a judge, when you walk in to see a judge, they say the presiding judge, right? Which means they they're ruling over that court, right? They're gonna give rule in that court. So that's kind of how Daniel was. Daniel was like a judge. He was made a judge of three. Right. But he was made now the top. The reason why he got that position is because you know how stuff runs. Right. So I got my princes. I got my rulers all over the place. But I need some people in here that knows how this place works, who've been around for a while. You, you were third in command. OK, I want you to be the top of the three presidents. Right. Keep going. Then this Daniel was preferred above all above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king mm -hmm. thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find no occasion nor fault for as much as he, he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. 
Then said these men, we shall not found, find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Look at that. This is the position we need to make sure we are in. It's tough. It's hard. I get it. But we have to put people in a position where they have to call God wrong to call us wrong. Right? That is the only way we win. If we suffer under those conditions, oh, man, all glory to the most high God. Right? Those are the kids. A lot of times we spend our time suffering because of our mess, because of bad decisions, because of sin, because of lust, because of all the foolishness that we deal with. That gets in the way and slows down the most high God's plan for us. It don't slow down his plan for the world. It slow down his plan for us. Right? He got plans for each and every one of us that if we choose, we can live. We can experience some great things. We can suffer through some great things and be a testimony to the next person. But we end up slowing it down because we rebel, we hypocrite, we do the most. Right? We have to put people in a position. Imagine nobody can find any dirt on you. That puts them in a position nowadays they just going to lie on you, right? People were a little bit more honest back then because it's before Satan was all over the world, right? So they, they didn't even think to just, oh, let's come up with a lie about Daniel and make it convincing, right? That, you know what I'm saying? Book ain't even described nothing like that. That, that. that wouldn't even work, right? So instead, they had to say, we have to find a way to bring conflict between Daniel's God, Yahuwah, and Darius the king, right? Watch how they came up with this thing. And these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes and counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any God or man for 30 days, except you, O king, be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Right? Why would this make sense? Why would this make sense to King Darius? Put yourself in King Darius' shoes, right? You just acquired this new property. Bunch of people working on that property for you already, right? But you don't know these people and they don't know you. So you took people of the land, people that you either felt like you could trust or you felt like they feared you enough where you can you can kind of, you know, what I'm saying, figure it out. You took some of your people that you already trust and you took some people that was high ranking and seemed like they had some good spirit in them. And you spread all these people to rule over all of your territory. Right. So now these gentlemen who work for you come up to you and they say, yo, 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 we got a great idea. Let's tell everybody, all these wild people that we, we ruling over now, a lot of these new people, people we ain't never dealt with before. Let's tell all these people, they can't make any inquiry to their God for 30 days. They have to only come to you. Why might that seem like a good idea to Darius? Wouldn't that make him supreme? Right. He dealing with all these people that got different gods. They serve different stuff. They got different beliefs. But he needs to establish himself as the king over all that stuff. Right. He needs to establish himself to see, OK, hold on. If these people serve me more than everything, if they put me before they gods and they idols, well, I'm in a good place as a king. So in his mind, this might sound like a great idea. Watch this. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, right, he Daniel, signed it. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened the chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did before time. Right, so he did it three times a day, but he did it right in the window, thing open. So what does that tell you? Ain't worried about all that. He wasn't hiding a thing. 
He wasn't hiding a thing, right? What he did is he stayed consistent with his normal routine. Now, he could have closed it. It ain't no, it ain't no law, no commandment that say you got to pray with your window open. There's not one commandment that tell you that. Right? He just didn't change his stuff. So he's, he's maybe even knowing that this is going to be a problem, invited the confrontation. Or he just said, hey, I'm going to keep my normal routine and didn't even think of the consequences. Either way, he prayed with the, door, with the, with the window wide open. Right? And kept his same routine of three times a day, he'd jump on his knees to do it. Right? Keep going. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Has thou not signed a decree that every man shall ask a petition of any God or man within 30 days? Except you, O king, shall be cast in the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the mm -hmm. king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored to the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Median Persians is that no decree nor salute which the king established may be changed. Then the king All right. Ended. So now he's dealing with a political situation. They have a tradition that, hey, if that's what the law say, can't nobody turn it. Right? If the law say they got to die, then they got to die. Right? So he knows, oh, man, that is our tradition. He know if he upset that, somebody might try to take the, the people might turn on him and might try to take the throne for, from him. So he's thinking he likes Daniel, but he didn't know. He didn't pay attention enough to Daniel to know that even if you, you make this law, Daniel going to keep doing what he's doing. He had no intentions on Daniel getting caught up in this law. He likes Daniel. But the people knew, like, mm, we can get him with this. We know that King Darius will like this law, and we also know that Daniel going to keep doing what he's doing, that which is going to put him in conflict with this law. King Darius going to have to kill him. That'll get Daniel out of the way. We ain't got to kill him ourselves. We can just set him up, and then we don't have to deal with Daniel being the top and being his favorite, right? So they try to set him up. The king is looking like, King Darius looking like, man, is there any way I can get Daniel out of this? He's looking through his law. He's like, man, is there a loophole I can exploit? He's trying to, when the book say he's trying to deliver him, he's trying to get him out of it. He's trying to make sure that Daniel don't go, got to go in the, the dinner lines. Because he know them lions going to eat his butt up. Keep going, watch this. Then the king commanded and brought Daniel and cast him into the dinner lines. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, thy God whom thou serves continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet. And when the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the he morning. He said he couldn't morning, sleep. And he woke up early in the morning. Watch this. And went in haste into the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the mouths of the lions that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. And the right. King so the most high God calls the, the lions to not even touch him. Right. But now the king technically has completed the law because the law just said they got to go to the den of lions. And Daniel did just that. He spent the night with the den of lions. Right. So he survived. He let him out. So now the king can say, well, I kept the law, right? 
I kept my decree, but watch what he did next. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives, and the lions had the mastery of them, and break all their bones in pieces, wherever they came at the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and that his dominion shall be even unto the end. He right. So where you think, where you think uh, Darius got that message from? Nebuchadnezzar. He had to get it from Daniel. Right. Remember, after Nebuchadnezzar went on, Daniel had these visions. And he had visions of, okay, well, in this time, there's going to be a son of man come from the clouds. He's going to rule forever, rule forever. And at this time, it's going to be a, a, a goat with a great horn that comes out of four horns. And it's going to happen in the latter times that this goat going to go up against the prince of princes. Oh, and then that prince of princes kingdom is going to be forever. Right? So he knows these things already. So he took, he's talking to him. He's talking to King Darius about, look, this is who my God is. This is how he works. You know what I'm saying? This is who I serve. And then now Darius looking like, man, that's a bad God you're dealing with. I don't know about these other people, God, but I've seen yours for real. Let me write this message. So he told him, he was like, everybody everywhere got to tremble before Daniel's God. This is important because the work that Daniel doing, notice that Daniel is in captivity to these people. This is the land of Daniel's captivity. And when he, after this king put him inside of the lion's den, that same king comes and runs after him and says, Daniel, are you in there? Was your God able to deliver you? And Daniel's response was, O king, live forever. Daniel never lost his respect for him. We would be calling Daniel a coon right now in America. Right? Imagine, just imagine. President Trump, right, taking a liking to some black boy. And the black boy supports President Trump. Let's not use Trump. Let's use somebody else. Let's use President Biden, right? And up black folk, we love President Biden. President Biden, I just saw, I just saw he went to the jungles, boy. You know what I'm saying? President, President Biden went to Baldwin Village in L.A. to the jungles. And ate some darn, uh, he might have ate chicken with them folks. Disrespectful, right? But these people love it. We love it for whatever reason we love it, right? So let's say we mess him. We support President Biden. We with him. We say, okay, President Biden, I'm by your side. But then somebody don't like the fact that President Biden like, he don't like, they don't like the fact that he like us so much, right? So you know what they did? They set up a law, a law that they knew President Biden would like, right? But they knew President Biden wouldn't, wouldn't know that that law going to catch us up. And all of a sudden, we get caught in that law because we ain't going to change, right? And President Biden has to put us in jail for the rest of our life. That would be like the most high God coming and finding and giving evidence to get us off of that charge. Right. And knowing that President Biden is the one that signed that bill and put us put us in jail, put all our people in jail, because this is what he really did. Right. Put all our people in jail. We come back to him and we say, oh, king or oh, president, live forever. And give respect to him. There's people that's doing that right now with President Biden. And guess what we call him? Because he did put all our people in jail, a lot of our people in jail. Right. We call him coon. This would look no different to the naked eye. To the naked eye, we look at this is the land of our captivity. You got King Darius that took over. He ain't letting us free. Sure, he, he giving you, you know what I'm saying? He like you, Daniel, but you just a token. The rest of our people is still in captivity, still dealing with the stuff of this land. Ain't nobody told us we can go back to our land. Ain't nobody trying to help us. Ain't nobody looking at what Nebuchadnezzar did to us and tried to restore it. Daniel, you've been cozying up to all these kings. You were down with Nebuchadnezzar. You were down with darn Belshazzar. Now you're down with darn Darius, right? 
it's so many of these kings you down with. So it's like everybody kind of looking at it like, man, I don't know about that. But the man responds, O king, live forever. And with that response, Darius sends out a letter to everybody saying, everybody everywhere got to tremble before Daniel's God. It's important to make sure we understand what this looks like, right? Because stuff is going to get confusing one day, I'm telling you. Stuff is going to look bad, and it's actually, it's already like that now, but stuff is going to look bad, and it's actually good. Stuff is going to look good, and it's actually bad. The only way we can sort through this is by staying very close to what has happened as examples in our history, talking about the scriptural history, and then also what our law says and commands us to do. If we do those things, we'll be perfect out here in these streets. Right? But if we're not paying very close attention and challenging everything against the scriptures, we're going to make a mistake somewhere. And that mistake is either going to send you to hell, or even if, you know, you make a mistake that has nothing to do with commandments, you keep all the commandments of the Most High God, but you make a mistake still, then it's just going to slow you down and make things more challenging for you. You'll still get into the kingdom, but you still, you know what I'm saying, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get slowed down because you made a misstep. You made an unwise decision. Right? Keep going. So this Daniel, he delivered and rescued, and he worked signs and wonders in heaven and earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Right? So in the reign of Darius... And in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Important to know that name. Cyrus, the Persian. Darius was a Persian or a Mede? He was a Mede. He was a Mede. Right? But then you have Cyrus, the Persian. Give me Ezra, chapter 1, verse 1. Ezra, chapter 1, verse 1. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of Yahuwah by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahuwah, God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who Why in the world Lord? might Cyrus believe this? I think Daniel was uh Daniel was still by Cyrus' side at the time. That's because Daniel was by Cyrus' side, right? Daniel talked to Nebuchadnezzar. What happened to Nebuchadnezzar? Man starts serving the Most High God. He talked to Belshazzar. He told Belshazzar, "Listen, you know what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. You should have listened. Now, you know what I'm saying? Most High God gonna take your stuff from you." Right? What happened to Belshazzar? They ain't got taken from him. Darius come in. He's like, man, look, I like you, Daniel. You nice. I want you to be the top president. Right? Then Darius end up serving God. So you see everybody that Daniel is interacting with serves the most high God. And now Cyrus is no different. Let me see here. Grab um, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28. This is Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28. So now if we look, if we look, if we look at our chart, Isaiah came way back here, right? Isaiah was like, 700 BC time frame. What we read now is in the 500 BC time frame. So this is 200 years later. Right? 200 years later than what we're about to read right now. 
This is Isaiah chapter 44. What verse I say? 28. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28. That saith unto Cyrus, He is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built into the temple, thou foundation shall be laid. So now, 200 years before this happened, there is a prophecy from Isaiah saying, My servant Cyrus. Let's read it again. Give me, if that was verse 28, give me verse 26. That confirmed the word of his servant that and performs the counsel of his messengers that says to Jerusalem, thou shall be inhabited into the cities of Judah. You shall be built. I will raise up the decayed places thereof that says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up the rivers that says to Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shall be built into the temple. The foundation shall be laid. Now, let's go back to Ezra, Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. And let's look at the language that Cyrus uses in this letter. This is Ezra, Ezra chapter 1, verse 1 again. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all the kingdom and put it into writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven has given me the kingdoms of the earth and has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Jeru which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him and let him go to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, to build a house to Yahuwah, God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. And who's right? So notice he said, the Most High God has charged me to do it. Why would he think that the Most High God charged him? You think he spoke to the Most High God? You think the Most High God gave him a vision and a dream? Or do you think Daniel is sitting there saying, man, look, your name's Cyrus, and this can't be a coincidence. Look at this. Look at this. Look, this is Isaiah. This is one of our prophets. He's around 200 years ago. Guess what he said? He said, Cyrus, you God's shepherd. Ain't that crazy? It's right here. I'm telling you. It's right here, Cyrus. You got that. He said that you're going to build it. Why else would Cyrus, why, why wouldn't any of these kings pop up and say, yo, go ahead and go build y'all place again? Cyrus pop up because it's like Daniel showing it to him in the scripture. It's how I like to imagine it. He's showing it to him in the scripture like, man, it's right here. Cyrus looking at that like, for real? You think that's talking about me? Who else is talking about? Our temple destroyed. You happen to be the king right now. Jeremiah told us it'd be 70 years. We approaching that time frame. You know what I'm saying? What you think? He probably laying all the prophecy out right to Cyrus. And Cyrus looking at it like, hmm. You know, Darius did speak highly of you. You know what? Darius sent out this letter. You know what? Nebuchadnezzar had a similar letter. He look at all this stuff, all this work that Daniel been putting in with these men. Our people will look at Daniel like he a coon. But Daniel is getting results. And he ain't kissing no butt to do it. He's standing up for what he believe in. He ain't hypocrite not one time. He ain't trying to accept no gifts from these people. But y'all would call him a coon. It's important that we understand the difference from somebody who breaks their back to serve these people versus somebody who's respectful with integrity. So quick to call everybody a coon and so quick to y'all going to miss it. Now, I will say the people y'all calling coons, they are coons right now. Y'all ain't now y'all not wrong about it. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying y'all got to be you know, slow to the trigger. You know what I'm saying? Because one day it's going to get tricky. Right now it's easy. All these boys is coon. Y'all right. right. We all right. When we when we call them a coon, they coon. You know what I'm saying? But one day it's going to get tricky. And that's what Satan wants. He want to show us a bunch of people that's, a, that's coons, a bunch of people that's false, a bunch of people that's hypocrites, to where we get so comfortable calling people coons and hypocrites and false prophets and all this stuff. We just get so comfortable. So then... We get one that's the real thing. And since so many of these other boys been fake and they look like the real thing, we're going to call the real thing a hypocrite. 
and a coon and a false prophet and they actually going to be real. Right? We just have to judge each situation like it's new. And everything got to be judged according to the book. Right? Just take our time with this stuff. And I can assure you we'd be calling Daniel a hypocrite. We'd be calling Daniel a coon right now. And imagine how detrimental that would be for the person who did something like that. When Daniel is literally responsible for getting us back into our land. Daniel is one of the greatest prophets we got. And that's easy to see because it's Daniel and we read it. That's not easy to say if you put yourself in their shoes. When your people getting towed up, your temple got stolen, and Daniel sitting on the side serving the people that's doing it. Being treated lovely. He ruling. He's enjoying himself. Right? He got riches, got money over there in captivity, all that stuff. It ain't, he ain't no slave. Daniel doing good. Gold chains and scarlet. He got his own house. He can open up the window and clearly everybody can see him in the window. So he probably got a nice house. Daniel doing good. Man, third in the whole darn kingdom under Belshazzar. Nebuchadnezzar put him in a high rank. You look at this and be like, man, he ain't suffering with us. It's easy to come up with. The, look, these are the thoughts. These are the thoughts. I don't know how to. When the prophet come, I don't know how the prophet going to come. I don't know what, what position. I don't know if he's going to be poor. I don't know if he's going to have money. I don't know that part. But there are going to be prophets that come. Right? In our days, or in days to come, there will be prophets that come. And I'm not talking about these, oh, it's somebody on this side of the room, prophets. I'm talking about legit prophets. Legit prophets that speak according to the scripture. Right? That says, thus says Yahuwah. They will be literal prophets, and we're going to have to decipher if they're real or fake. It's going to be no different. It's going to be worse than what we saw with Hananiah and Jeremiah. It's going to be worse than what we saw with Pasher and Jeremiah. Right? But we have to start conditioning ourselves to see things correctly now. Because if we don't, we're going to make some missteps. And sometimes the misstep is too much to correct. Right? We got an opportunity to get this thing right the first time. Keep going. And whosoever oh, that's Ezra, right? Yeah. Uh, go back to uh, well, we finished Daniel. Well, actually, that's good. Because we, we need to read Daniel 9, but Daniel 9, let's, let's read Daniel 9 next week, and then we're going to go into Ezra, and then we're going to start reading... Uh, you know what I'm saying? We're going to start reading from Ezra after that. Um, so we could, we could wrap up here. Any questions? So remember that we was just getting out of Jeremiah. Babylon took the kingdom. All our people thrown into captivity. Covered a little bit of Ezekiel. So we're nearing the end of the 70 years that God was saying. Y'all going to be in captivity for 70 years. After that, i let y'all come back. So we're nearing the end of the 70 years of captivity. That started when Babylon took us out of our home. All right, well, let's pray out. <laughs>